Thank you. What you just heard was when the levee breaks. It was done by it was done by Kansas Joe McCoy and Memphis Murray, many. And they wrote it about the great Mississippi flood of 1927, which was still in the people's memories. And this song was made in 1929. The flood affected 26,000 square miles of the Mississippi Delta. Hundreds, hundreds of people were killed and hundreds of thousands of residents were forced to evacuate. The event is the subject of several blues songs, the most popular being Backwater Blues by Bessie Smith in 1927 and Mississippi Heavy Water Blues by Barbecue Bob in 1928. But we're here tonight because in 1971, Led Zeppelin, a rock group considered one of the greatest rock groups of all time, recorded When the Levee Breaks for their untitled fourth album. When considering material for to record it, and the story goes that the lead singer, Robert Plant, had the song in his musical selection. Plant suggested Kansas Joe McCoy and Memphis Mini song should be on the album. Jimmy Page, who is the guitarist, commented that while Plant's lyrics identified with their original, he developed a new guitar riff that set it apart. However, it was the drumming of John Bonham that usually is noted as the defining characteristic of the song. So the next song you will hear is When the Levee Breaks by Led Zeppelin.
I want to thank you for joining us tonight. You are with the In The Loop Group of the Presbyterian of Baltimore. I am Kenneth Walker, co-convener with Annex Snyder. And tonight we will discuss the New York Times 1619 installment, The Birth of American Music, where the host Wesley Mars chronicles the evolution of American music and its intersection with the pulse and spirit of Africa, rhythm and blues and jazz that grew from the hearts and souls of enslaved Amer Africans on the plantations of the South to the streets of the industrial North and now the urban centers of cities across America and the world. Now tonight we have two presenters. We have Mr. Bruce Henderson, director of music at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church and Justice Georgie, Baltimore youth entrepreneur and spoken word enthusiast. They will share how black music has served as the predominant influence in the development of American culture and as Americans give to the world. Black music influence is seen in the secular and the sacred. It is the heartbeat of Saturday night's lived experience and the soul of our uplifted spirits in Sunday morning praise and worship. Black music chronicles the socio-political history of racism, oppression, and exclusion engendered in American history of enslavement of African peoples and its continued legacy. So like I said, one of our speakers is Bruce Henderson. Many of us know him as the Minister of Music at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church of Baltimore. He's also on the staff of Morgan State University's Memorial Chapel as a consultant for the music ministry. Mr. Henderson graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music and he's a and he has had a very musical career and is at home with many different styles of music. While at NEC, he studied composition with the influential and innovative composer and theorist, George Russell. While studying with Mr. Russell, Mr. Henderson became fully immense with Russell's theory of harmony and the system of composition that altered the course of American music and had a profound influence on the music of Miles Davis and John Coltrane, among many others. Now, our other presenter today is Mr. Justice Georgie, young dude, young entrepreneur and spoken word enthusiast. Originally from Baltimore, Justice is now a sophomore at Morgan State University, majoring in communications. And he is active in the Youth Rising Coalition sponsored by the Presbytery of Baltimore. But he has many other interests also. He works with public relations. He works on document, uh, documentaries. He's also a photographer and he's also a performer with the Wound Work Production Company. And if you don't know what they do, they, their performances tackle relevant social issues throughout the Baltimore community, including gun violence, domestic abuse, grief, drug alcohol abuse, gang violence, sexual assault, and racial equality. Their community performances also serve to enrich the local neighborhoods through cultural programs incorporating elements of traditional African dancing singing and performing with contemporary elements of hip hop, spoken word and rap. So as you can see, our presenters tonight know their music. So I'm gonna just sit back and let them take it from here. So Bruce and Justice, you guys are on.
Okay, thank you, Kenneth. And um, I appreciate being here this evening. And Justice, it's good to see you again. Um, okay, sorry, there's something going on right here on my computer. Yeah, look, I'm so glad to be here to be able to uh, be a presenter for this uh, uh, event this evening. This subject matter is near and dear uh, to my heart. I've spent a lot of years uh, involved in this music um, and I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world because of it. And I'm now able to hopefully share some of my experiences and understanding in situations like this. Uh, the idea of this music and its importance uh, how it's influenced um, American music and culture uh, throughout the existence of the United States is something that I feel has been passed on to me, and not just me, but all of, all of the musicians in my generation to continue to be sure that the message gets out about this music and its importance, not out of some sort of conceit, but, but because of all of the forces that tend to act against it to deny the importance of the music. Uh, as a musician and probably initially uh, a jazz musician, it's very important that we sit at the feet of the elders, the older musicians, learn from them, and then we are we are supposed to, we are obligated to carry forth the message, not just in terms of notes and rhythms, even though that's extremely important and that can be enough, but also in situations like this where we get to speak to it, interpret it and speak to it from the standpoint of um, African-American uh, musicians. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing to, to this session this evening. Just, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and uh, make yes, a Definitely. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to uh, thank you all for, uh, for having me here. Um, I'm truly humbled to be here, uh, as well as music definitely makes the world go around. And, and most importantly, our music. Uh, black music is not only just black music, you know, uh, rap. We have so many names, as you see on the screen right now. I'm looking at Beats, Rhythm, Flow, Jubilee Spirituals. I'm looking at Beats, Rhythm, Flow. I'm looking at uh, Black music, Jazz, Blues, R&B, Hip Hop. We have so many names, but at the end of the day, our music is American music. And music definitely has been um, a, a part of my life, um, as well as a part of my family's life. My, fa my father was a DJ, my brother is a, uh, a aspiring um, rap artist, and I'm just, growing up, I've always been in a household listening to what I would call old school, but what y'all would call y'all music. So I'm so um, happy to be here today. And without no further ado, let's do this, Mr. Bruce. All right, Justice. Okay, uh, so here we go. Uh, the, the first card that we are dealing with is what are the major genres of African-American music? What are their defining characteristics? And when did they come about? So we do want to at least get a little background information going as we talk about this. I'm going to try to do a little screen share right now. Hopefully it will work. Okay. And there should be a... All right, so there you should, you should see a, uh, a chart in front of you. And the, uh, the chart, uh, great, thank you, hey, Bob. And the chart should uh, lay out uh, just it's an interesting chart uh, that, that uh, deals with the evolution of uh, African American music. If you look on the sides going down, you can see hopefully the um, uh, the years and the dates. 
And then of course, in the, the boxes are the different um, uh, genres as laid out. So we're not gonna go through the entire chart survey, but to kind of start talking about it from that, from this perspective. Uh, at the top of the chart, you see African-American sacred traditions, African-American secular traditions, and then African-American secular traditional traditions uh, instrumental. Let, I wanna step a, a little bit before that and just first of all, talk about the African part. We talk a lot about African music and African-American music, but, but the question is, is, what is it about music that makes it African uh, beyond the fact that obviously Africans created it and beyond the fact that certainly when Africans were brought here in bondage, that they brought their music and culture with them. But then what is it about that music that, um, that makes it African? Because if you know a little bit about that, then certainly you can, you will be able to detect, find those aspects, even in music that's created here and now uh, in the United States. Um, so as we talk about African music, I'd like to talk just about uh, two characteristics or elements in the music that are important. First of all, and, 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 and probably overall, African music is always and has always been functional. And what that means is that it's been de determined or, or is created to regulate the uh, behavior of the community, to support uh, life ritual, to express life through its, and its rituals and, and, and the spirituality of life through sound, okay? Now, that is that, that the music is an integral part of every aspect of, of life in traditional African culture. Contrasted perhaps to European uh, tradition, which is a little more passive in, in its involvement with the music. Uh, the music is intended to, and, and please forgive me for any overgeneralizations, but intended more so for entertainment than the type of daily involvement. In other words, I, I get up in the morning and, and, and something is going on and I, I, there may be a song for that because it's a part of what's going on during the day. If there's a ritual that's going on, maybe the ritual has to do with, I don't know, maybe the passing, uh, maybe a young person is moving from one aspect of their lives uh, and being initiated into another uh, level of, 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 um, of, uh, of their lives. And there is music that will accompany that, not to be joyed from the standpoint of being but to express through sound that particular event that's going on. So it's to translate the uh, experiences of life into sound. Now, another thing about African music is that a lot of, of we, we used to, we, we've heard a lot about the idea of, uh, and sometimes the uh, in, in a negative way that uh, all black folks have rhythm. And we know that's, that's one of those types of sayings that we don't like to hear. Um, but in, I spent a year in Africa uh, and I got an opportunity to listen uh, to a number of uh, musicians and observe how people develop musically. And I also got a, a chance to listen to the language. And the language of many Afri that many Africans have uh, is based upon tonality. In other words, the tonality of a language or the tonality of a, a syllable will determine the meaning of what you're saying. Not just the, the syllables itself, but the sound, the pitch moving one from the other will determine, so determine the meaning of, of, the, uh, of the language. If I can just digress a little bit, one thing I was asked to do when I was over there was to sing an African song. And they taught me the syllables of that African song. Uh, and I tried my best, and this was in a public setting, and I tried my best to sing it, and people were laughing. But, and they were laughing because I mispronounced the syllables, but because I had the pitches misrepresented. 
So there's a certain development and understanding of pitch and uh, 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 sensitivity and understanding of pitch and rhythm that you grow up with if you grow up in a traditional African society. And that makes you particularly sensitive to um, uh, those ideas. Other aspects or elements of African music, we've heard call and response. Uh, so, and we know we hear that all of the time in, in, in church music, in pop music, in jazz, in all of American music. The idea of call and response is something that we are constantly, uh, constantly uh, hearing. For instance, uh, if I were to, let's say, play this piece here. Okay, it's not coming up. Okay, I want to play for you a piece that, that, that just illustrates this thing of call and response that I'm talking about. Okay, we'll, we'll do that later. All right, I won't worry about that now. We, we know that in call and response, what it, what it requires is there is a leader that who is also a soloist, and then there is the chorus or the rest of the group that responds to what it is that that leader is, uh, is saying. For instance, if you look, if you look at this one here. Okay, and uh, so I mean that was perfect. I mean that was that was that was that was that was beautiful. You heard that there was one individual who was leading the group, and then you saw that there were the others who responded. And that person that was leading it, not only were they leading, even though we don't know the uh, the language that was being spoken, the person that was leading it was also um, improvising in terms of what they were saying or what was being said. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, um, and also you noticed that there was dancing that was going on. And the thing is, is that in many African societies, there is no differentiation between dancing and music. There are no terms that separate dancing and music. Right? So all of this is a part of the, uh, the, 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 the African experience. And then the other piece is, and then I'll let it go, uh, the uh, other important element is the idea that music is transmitted orally, all right, from mouth to ear, both orally and orally from mouth to ear. And what that, one of the things that that causes is a certain integrity, the uh, transmission of the music, you have to remember it, and you have to remember it correctly. And then you have to pass it on. And so the individual is responsible to the community to be sure that they take the music as it was given to them and passed on in a way that is uh, uh, true to whatever it is that the music uh, uh, intended or the message of that music. I don't know, Justice, if there's something that you wanted to come in on there or not. Yes, sir, definitely. So uh, you definitely say, you know, a really great amount as well as speaking um, on the history. So when you hear about everything and when you hear about all these different genres, uh, Mr. Bruce, I love the fact of how you had the chart. I absolutely love that chart because it dates back to the first, the origin and to the modern era. 
So one of the so one of the things that everything has in common is soul, right? When you talk about different types of styles of music, when you talk about different genres, everything deprived of soul. So that's what we're going to get into in the next slide. Okay. Now, uh, before we move, okay, we, we move. Before we move on to the next slide, I just want to just just go ahead and do a, just a, a little survey of the rest, and and you want to kind of just keep your 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 uh, your minds open to what's coming here next. So we we talked about African sacred tradition. Just slide down a little bit and just talk about the idea of spiritual as real equipment, and understand that probably as we became African Americans, that it was the spiritual, it were the spirituals. That were probably the, that were the first uh, African Justice, can you chime in until um, I'm sorry. Comes what I apologize. What happened? My uh, my computer kind of cut out. What happened? What the? No, what Bruce was the last thing that Mister Bruce said? Um, he was talking about uh, the spirituals, but you can chime in on what you wanted to talk about, and then we'll come back to Bruce when he's able. Okay, great. All right, so I was going to uh, speak about um the soul portion of everything mm -hmm. because I said that everything. Uh, when you talk about uh, hip hop, when you talk about rap, when you talk about spirituals, everything starts with soul. And the thing is with soul, uh, the thing is once when you hear music from back then, you can hear that what our ancestors took was from pain. They took the pain and then they made it into the, a song. But the thing is, not only did they take the pain from the song, but also our ancestors, they they also uh, did like when they was talking about um, the star, following the star to get to get um, out of um, enslavement. They took from the pain, and all that comes from the soul. So I say all this to say and to go into the next slide, Mr. Kenneth. All right, so next slide. Does the fluid relationship between the sacred and secular realms of life that we find in traditional African culture have an influence, influence on African-American music and culture? Absolutely. So the thing is, when you, when you hear the difference, the music that we listen to now, right? When you hear of rap music, right? Rap music currently is pop music, but all of it has stems from what came before it, which was hip hop. So what Mr. Bruce showed in the beginning on his slide, which was a really great slide. I wish I would have took a picture of that, but you see all of these different genres. You see the go-go music, you see the rhythm and blues, but all of it has a story. All of it dates back, especially when you go into Christian music, when you go into church music. We have all these different names, but where does it go back from? It goes back from the pain. It goes back to the storytelling that our, that our ancestors have laid the foundation to what we call music today. Whether that, whether you listen to hip hop, whether you listen to rhythm and blues, whether you listen to jazz, whether you even listen to rock, all of it sets the foundation of storytelling. Is Mr. Bruce back yet? If he wanted to chime in or no? Yeah, I'm sorry. We're having some technical technical difficulties over here. Oh, I, I understand. Yeah. I was too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the... Um... The whole idea of the sacred and secular. This is another African concept. And I just want to put, put forward to you that the idea of a separation between what is sacred and what is secular is, is not a traditional African concept. There is no separation between the sacred and the secular. 
the secular, the spiritual is an integral part of your lives. And so the secular or the sacred uh, uh, regulates and is a part of every of all that you do, whether it's education, whether it's economics, whether it is harvesting, whether it, whatever it is, there is a secular aspect. In many African cultures, there's no word for religion as such because they believe that God is everywhere. God is in and a part of everywhere and you are God and relating to God and in a relationship with God, no matter what it is that you are doing. So the concept that there is something that is material and then there is something that is spiritual is not the way it operates, is not the way it works. The material and the spiritual are all together, okay? And that is also reflected uh, in the music because remember the music is an expression of whatever the ritual is that you are, be, that you are a part of. So it's important that, that, we, uh, that we understand that, that there's no separation there. Um, I know that, that perhaps some people are saying, well, Africa is a big continent. So can you really make statements that generalize about the entirety of the African continent when you've got 3,000 languages there, when, when you've got all types of ethnic groups? But yes, they're, they're in, and I don't say that myself, I say that in reading the works of different uh, authors and African authors to say that even though there are different ethnic groups and different languages throughout Africa, there are some commonalities in terms of their, the sense of relating to God that is unified throughout the continent and it was brought over. So it doesn't matter where you came from, whether you were brought from Western Africa or Central Africa uh, or wherever, because in our history, most have come from Central and Western Africa. But that concept of is, is there. The other thing is the concept of, of God as being the one is an African concept. All right, I, I know a lot of times we've been taught, perhaps we've been taught that in some uh, traditional African spiritual systems that it, it is kind of comprised of a, 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 a number of different deities, you know, all of these gods that, they're being, that are being worshiped and that somehow there is no central God. But according to some of the writers uh, who, who have uh, written on that, and these are African writers, John Mibiti is one of them, uh, that the concept of a, a singular powerful God is very common and unified throughout the, uh, uh, the African concept uh, uh, con uh, continent and throughout the African culture. And so that was brought over when they came here. You know, but also, as I said before, the idea that there is no separation between what is quote unquote sacred and quote unquote secular. If you can imagine, if you can imagine somehow now, of course, as after, after Africans arrived, eventually we more and more had to kind of take on perhaps some of those, some of that concept of the spiritual and the sacred. There's a song that, that I like to do by Donald Lawrence that's called spiritual. And it says, you're not a natural being living in a spiritual experience, but you're a spiritual being having a natural experience. And what that is, is it talks about the fact that there is no separation, though you may be moving through aspects of, of spirituality and not. And the question is, do you find that in African music, African-American music here in the United States? Do you find it that idea of the, the, uh, of the spiritual and the, and the uh, secular together in uh, even popular music in the United States. Has that, has that concept kind of come forward anyway? And do we find that we're talking about those things even in quote unquote secular situations? Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, 
Oh, I was just about to say, is it showing up on my screen? All right, so transformation, making Christianity your own. All right, so now when you talk about uh, when you talk about the modern gospel music, right, and when you differentiate, you know, songs from then and songs from now, I have two songs. One is not that old. It's like only in the 90s. But but you're going to hear, but, but this is an old song, all right? All right, it's not that old. But you're about to hear the difference between then and now. All right. You guys probably already heard the song before. It's called No Weapon. Yeah, I know you know this song. They play this song at church all the time. And you bob your head to it. All right. So that was No Weapon. That is a really good song, but it just goes to show you, you know, how the soul within the song and the story behind it. Yes, that is, you know, a gospel song, but still at the same time, you got to hear about the rhythm. You got to hear the emotion as well as you got to hear the passion behind his voice and really, really, really analyze what he's saying. All right. So now I'm about to display a song that's, that's not old and is new. And it's uh, by the artist Chance the Rapper, and it's called Blessings. Now you're gonna you're gonna hear how modernized it is, and how uh, hip hop has played a huge effect. All right, so that was just a snippet of the two songs, but but you hear how modernized it is, even though, like, despite, yes, it is a gospel song. This is a song that personally I've been trying to play in church for the longest time, and my mom finally let me play it in church, and she didn't think that people in my church will like it because it's so like new school. It's so like, you know, you hear the beat, you know, you hear the burp, 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 you know, you hear the trumpet and everything. And then you hear how fast paced it is. But still, at the same time, it's still a gospel song. You know, it's not it's no cursing. And it just goes to show you that with hip hop nowadays, not all of it's bad. And you see how how much gospel as we know it has evolutionized you know it used to be a time when you know of course you hear gospel music you know you're a kid you hear the song and sometimes it might put you to sleep but at the same time sometimes like that might be a taste of music and you hear and you hear gospel music now you might be like what is that that sound like a regular song but no it's a gospel song just with a modern taste on it Mr. Bruce, do you want to add anything? You know, that uh, that idea of the music being transformed uh, to adapt to the needs of the time and the people at this point in time, I think is, is what, what we're talking about. 
And that's a cycle that is continuous. And it goes back to the very beginnings um, when we talk about African-Americans on as, as uh, enslaved people on this soil. Uh, and then, uh, or, or let's say, put it this way, as Africans being enslaved people on the soil and then trans being transformed into being African-Americans. That kind of ad adaptation is at the core of all that we can observe in terms of how this music has come about. Uh, the idea of spontaneity and improvisation as, as, a, as a means of adaptation, as opposed to not being a, a way of just freestyling. I mean, freestyling is, is okay, and I understand the term, but understand that improvisation is a sacred concept. The idea to be able to take in what's going on in your surroundings and to adapt it to whatever it is that's going on so that it's meaningful, but, retain, but retains the, uh, the uh, importance of what it is. So I, I think that's, that's something that we find in the music uh, throughout. If, uh, if I can be just a little historical because I have a historical uh, bit and I think it's important to, uh, to, to understand that. As I said, that's been going on from the beginning. Um, there was a place in New Orleans back in the 19th century that was called Congo Square. Uh, and what it was, was a place that, uh, that uh, on Sundays, Africans, especially, and other ethnic groups would come together, establish a marketplace. They would sing and they would dance uh, and they would share culturally, they would share. And that place called Congo Square, and it still exists in New Orleans today. There's, there's a, uh, a placard there. It's, it's actually in that place that we know of called Trimmy uh, from, the, from the, uh, you know, the TV show, um, was a place where those types of transformations were allowed uh, to come about and allowed to, to happen. Uh, as the people got together and established those things that they needed to express, even though they were coming from different places, different cultures. Uh, obviously, we know the story of how slavery tore apart as, uh, tribes, as they call them, but families. But the idea of coming together as separate and different families through the music. Uh, has been a thing that has been a part of it uh, all along. Uh, and then the idea of adapting to your surrounding. For instance, and then I'll be done. The idea of Congo Square was able to happen in New Orleans because interestingly enough, New Orleans was colonized by uh, the French. And the way that French, the French and Spanish colonizers worked or, or, or uh, allowed Africans to interact was totally different than the way the Protestant, the Protestant uh, 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 tradition. And so to go out and, and uh, express yourself and to keep your music and keep your culture is something that um, that was, was able to happen in New Orleans because of the nature of, of it. And you know, and you find it, you even find it in uh, the fact that there are religions, uh, uh, when Africans took on like the Catholic religion, uh, which is a part of the French and the Spanish tradition, not a part of the Protestant tradition, that they were able to meld together, to syncretize, for instance, the concept of multiple saints in Catholic religions with the idea of the, for instance, the Yoruba Orishas, what we call the different African gods. And you will find that those meldings came about. So Saint, uh, Saint George was also an Orisha in terms of how Africans um, 
celebrated and understood him. So this total breaking down of boundaries in order to be able to survive is something that happens. And, and as, as Justice was saying, so you even hear it now, you say, well, okay, then, you know, my mother would even let me, you know, play this song in church because some of us are still dealing with those boundaries. But those boundaries are really gonna break down. And those are the same boundaries that are breaking down that we're talking about when we talk about breaking chains. And the thing about this, Ameri this African-American experience, if nothing else, it's been about breaking down boundaries, break, tearing down chains. And it happens in the music immediately. You can hear it more immediately in the music, perhaps, than you can hear, than, than, than you might observe in other social or behavioral things that we as humans do. All right, so we have cultural appropriation. Uh, the question is, what are some ways that mainstream America co commanded, I'm sorry if I, uh, if I got it wrong, the music and culture of African Americans? Ms. Mr. Bruce, you wanna take this one, then I'll follow up? Sure, yeah. So the whole idea, whole idea is this. You know, we come to America and um, America is, is trying to establish who he or she, who she is. Uh, and from standpoint of music uh, and the history and not just music, but, but in, in all aspects of, of human behavior in life. But since we're talking about music, we'll stay with the music. The idea of those, the music culture being appropriated, being commandeered, being taken and then being exploited for profit one way or the other is what this is really, what this slide uh, that's there is talking about. Cultural appropriation is about stealing the music and then profiting on it. And the, and the history is replete with um, uh, examples of that, uh, of that commandeering. Uh, I put forth that African-American music is essential to the sound of what American music is. And it's a valuable resource that like slavery has been used to gain profit for those who are being oppressed. And they happen, it happens throughout history and it's still happening today. I mean, even if we're talking about, okay, well, maybe we know about the stories of, I don't know, you know, Elvis Presley singing, you know, uh, Hound Dog by Big Mama Thornton, or, you know, or, you know, or maybe, or, or I can look at the, the slide here. That's Big Mama Thornton up there in, in the left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. And the reason that she's up there is because of that. Uh, and under her, you see uh, Little Richard. And you may know the stories of Little Richard and Pat Boone. And Pat Boone might have made more, more, more money on Tutti Rudy than Little Richard. Uh, Otis Blackwell, uh, down there in the corner, uh, wrote uh, Return to Cinder, uh, Don't Be Cruel, All Shook Up. Great Balls of Fire. Now, some of us may remember those songs. I mean, we're going back a little bit. Great Balls of Fire, I think, was Jerry Lewis and, and that kind of thing, you know. And even Bob Marley um, has had his music commandeered uh, in, in various ways. So we said, well, is that something of the past? No, because today, Yep. Uh, musicians are being ripped off. If you if you think of the fact that basically popular music, quote unquote, and then American music, mm -hmm. okay, is at its core African American. Now I'm not saying that there are no other influences, but we're talking about the African American point of view. 
if you understand that. And then look at just how the record industry operates. You're an artist in the popular record uh, 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 field. <laughs> For you to get your music played, you won't have to give up your firstborn. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who are, are, are very, uh, who are popular. Mm -hmm. But basically what you do is you say, I turn over my uh, uh, authorship to the record company. I turn over my mechanical rights. And what a mechanical rights are, basically you turn over your ability to, to move that recording around and get paid for it. In return for, they'll give you maybe, you know, some kind of little measly check up front, okay? And <clears throat> you owe the record comp pretty much in perpetuity. Uh, perhaps you'll get some measly percentage of the royalties. And the uh, rationale is, well, as record companies, we're putting up all of the, we're, we're assuming all of the risk. Uh, financially. And since we're assuming all of the risk, then you need to turn this over to us. And as a, as a result of that, we can just kind of rip you off and take your music. Now, there are exceptions. There are certainly exceptions. But to this day, to this, to this day in time, <clears throat> that's what happens to Black artists. But if you look at Billboard, you'll see that the majority of artists on Billboard who are the top 100 are going to be white artists. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be white artists singing black music. Yeah? I mean, and, 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 and even country western. Even country western. Okay? Because we know country western is really nothing more than an offshoot of African American music. It's a blending. It's a blending. I'm not saying that there were no other in, in, uh, uh, influences that were a part of that. But the problem is, is that there's an inequitable return on the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's talk about the banjo, okay? All right, and how important the banjo is in uh, the, the sound of, of uh, certain types of American music. Well, the banjo is an African instrument for you all that, that don't know. It's an African instrument. Uh, uh, Bela Fleck, I don't know if you know who Bela Fleck is, but Bela Fleck is a great uh, a banjo artist. Uh, and he had, to, he had to travel to Africa to find out the roots of what he was doing. So you find that on one level, Africans and other Americans come together and they share the uh, music and they share the cultural experiences and that's a beautiful thing, all right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened first, I would, I would imagine. Folks got together and they started sharing things. You know, because even in America, even though whites and blacks were supposed to be separate and we, have, we know the whole story about that, that didn't keep people from getting together. But then you take it to the next level and then all of a sudden the sharing, it becomes like, okay, uh, and if I may be, be blunt. Mm -hmm. Say, like, well, okay, uh, uh, young Johnny, you know, who might be uh, the son of the owner of the master of the plantation, you know, you might be, you might be playing with the, the little uh, uh, black children out here in, in the, uh, you know, wherever they might be playing. And you may, and you will share. But when it gets to the point of profiting, on what it is that you have and that you, that, uh, all of a sudden that changes and it becomes, it goes from friendship to expectation. So the appropriation of a person's uh, giving, a person's creativity is uh, what we're talking about. You know, on the screen, we have some uh, pioneers that is very instrumental, that is very influential 
for the culture. We have Louis Armstrong, we have James Brown, we have Aretha Franklin, as well as Chuck Berry. But the thing is, we also, we have a lot of people who are missing from the screen. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, oh, look, and we have even more. <laughs> there we go, with the next one. We, and we have even more faces. But the thing is, you know, the question says, is there any genre uh, of American music that does not have African-American influences or elements? When I look at that question, <laughs> I say absolutely not. All, I'm talking about every single genre. Every single genre we have influence. Each and every genre we have influence. We have paved the milestone. We have paved the way for all of the artists here today. And especially all of these names that is right here, we have done it. This is why this is why we're here today. This is why we have the 1619 project. This is why we have to talk about our history. Because our history is American history. But the sad thing is that today is they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about how they don't want to talk about how Chuck Berry, what Chuck Berry is there for the culture. They don't want to talk about how, how Aretha Franklin has done this. They don't want to talk about how James Brown has also influenced this. Before coming to you all today, I saw a question on Google and it, and it said, who was the king of pop? Now, everybody knows the king of pop is Michael Jackson, who was a black man. I saw Justin Bieber. I lied to you not. I saw it said Justin Bieber. I saw another question on Google and it says, who is the king of rap? I saw Eminem, a white man. Now, let me just tell each and every one of you on the Zoom call that is furthest from the truth. And it's time today that our black pioneers, our black musicians get the recognition that that they deserve because I'm fed up. You wanna, uh, so hey, here, oh my bad. When this next screen, 10 of the most influential American musicians. Now for our guests, I would like you guys to get a pencil and paper and write down the names of these uh, musicians, if you know them. And then in a couple of minutes, we're going to show their names. But write down the names of these musicians that you know. Give you a couple of minutes. Now, as you can see, these musicians cover many genres and from the 1900s, 1920s, up until now. So if we get all of them, that would be pretty good. go now i want you guys to be honest if you got all of them and this is something we'll discuss probably on the 19th when we come back okay let's go okay bruce and justice you can pick up from here yeah, that, that question is more so a question that I would put out, and it might be something you might we might want to discuss when we come back. Uh, the idea of the blues, we hear about that that phrase a lot. And so the question I put forth is, is the uh, blues a genre of music, or is it a feeling? And that might be something we might want, something that we can suspect, because I'd like a little, <clears throat> interesting to have a, uh, 
uh, reaction and, and response on that question. Yeah. Uh, I, I know my answers, you know, but, um, you know, we hear the, the, the term thrown around a lot in America. Uh, so what is that? Is, is the blues a genre? All right. Now we have my favorite part. We have rap and we have hip hop. Mr. Breeze, I think you froze. All right. So on a screen, all you see is icons because that's what I'm looking at right now. One of the things about rap and hip hop, right? Now, some of you might say rap and hip hop, isn't that the same thing? And you, my friend, I will say no. Now, hip hop is the godfather, okay? I'm gonna be honest. Hip hop is definitely the uh, is, is definitely the grandfather of everything, but hip hop gave birth to what we know now today as rap music. Now, what hip hop is is hip hop is a mix of uh, of DJing, you know, scratching, <laughs> um, along with emceeing. Uh, you gotta have some graffiti in hip hop. You have to, you have to have graffiti, and as well as dance. Okay, so now when you listen to songs today, you know if you don't have the if you don't have that, 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 that if you don't have that, it's not hip hop. If you don't hear, we call it lyricists, okay? If you don't hear storytelling in a song, that's really now like a hip hop song could be somebody telling you about that day. I went to wash clothes, uh, and then I came out. I wanted to see what was y'all talking about. You know, like hip hop definitely gives you a story and makes you get excited. It makes you groove your head. It makes you buggy, wuggy, wuggy, wuggy. Okay, now rap, all right? Now you might ask me now, okay, cool. All right, Justice, you already talked to us about rap. I mean, about hip hop. All right, all right, that's good. Now, what's rap? Rap, that's a very good question. Well, rap music is, is pop. It's pop culture today. It's pop music today. That's what rap is. Okay, now rap, it don't consist all of the elements of hip hop because it's very different, right? But what rap is, is all you need is a cool beat and you need to rhyme, all right? Now there's different uh, elements of rap that some may consider of hip hop, but y'all, I challenge all of you today, all right? to look up a rap song in the 80s and look up a rap song in the 2000s. You're gonna hear the difference, all right? You are definitely gonna hear the difference. So the second question, doesn't matter what something is called and who named it, what's in a name, all right? The thing is uh, about this is, does it matter? Uh, I say uh, it does matter in a sense because the thing is like, you want to like, you don't want to like butcher the name within like any, uh, with all of our music influencers and everything. You don't want to get the name wrong. All right. Some people might say, oh, well, um, I heard, I heard some people call Tupac, the artist, Tupac. Uh, uh, who was that guy? His name is Tupac. Uh, yeah, 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 come with me. No, it's Tupac. You know, that's not, we don't, we don't do that with, uh, we don't do that with, um, I'm trying to think, uh, with was Armstrong, you know, we don't do that with uh, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, we don't, we don't screw up their names. All right, cool. So let's not let's not mess up our names. Let's not whether it's the songs, whether it's anything that we do. Let's get it right and keep that same energy. All right. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just, if I could, just quickly. And you're absolutely right, uh, Justice. But then you can also look at the idea of the concept of a name in terms of what's in a name. 
I was I was in a, a meeting last week with uh, people who are the institution of, of the Institute of Pan African Music, uh, and we were just talking about just how the music has been named, uh, not necessarily individuals, and who has named them. And I know just very briefly, in my experience with uh, Af with uh, for instance jazz musicians and important jazz musicians who have changed the music, that the idea of calling jazz jazz is not something that those musicians that you know about, perhaps you've heard of Charlie Parker, perhaps you've heard of Miles Davis. Let's just, let's just say Miles Davis. And Miles Davis himself uh, was not, not a fan of the word jazz, you know? And a number of those, those musicians were not a, a fan of that jazz because there were certain connotations that came along with that term jazz, uh, where it came from, uh, the fact that, that it was an, um, uh, a term that wasn't necessarily uh, a positive term, if I can put it that way. Many jazz musicians don't even, didn't use that term, jazz. Many, there, there have been, and there are still to um, uh, uh, debates as what we call this music that we call jazz. One thing people have come up with is the idea of in America's classical music, because it is the music it, that America has produced that embodies all of those concepts that we are into quote unquote classical music. Uh, European concert music in that tradition. So the idea of what's in a name and does it matter who names it is akin to, okay, all right, well, all right, here I am and we've just gotten a group of, of African Americans in here and we're going to separate the family and we're going to name them what we want to name them. My name is Bruce Henderson. Now, I don't think it, it would have been Bruce Henderson where I born wherever it is that my people came from, all right? Henderson is Scottish, but I'm not Scottish. Yes. And I don't, I don't share the Scottish history, good or bad. Mm -hmm. So someone one day finds a record of me and they don't know whether I'm black or white, then they may mistake me as being one thing and not what I am it's because somebody else named me somebody else named my family so what's in a name in terms of the music you know and just to finish that's a marketing issue if you mark you market things to make your money and you you establish what the name is going to be and then you determine and you target the people who are going to purchase that music. You establish a or a, a, a description around that music. You determine whether or not it's good music to listen to or not. You know, you talk about rap. You know, there was a time when rap music was primarily positive. If you're talking about KRS-One and a number of the other older folks or if you are older musicians or if you talk about where it came from. There were groups like, um, uh, uh, well, there are a number of, of different groups that were out beforehand before rap became rap. But it was determined that rap needs to be called rap and it needs to have these elements, regardless of what the artist determined. And then it was appropriated and marketed. So that's what I see in the, the, that, that question, what's in a name and does it matter uh, who named it? I would think that the person that created it should have something to do with naming it. I wish you an that, brother. All right, so now we have is the message of the music and the text or the beat. Can a melody or rhythm be evil? <laughs> that is evil. <laughs> so so Mr. Bruce I feel as though me and you should you know like have a conversation and talk about this right okay because 
now, now when you say now, like in the slide, right? When it says like, can a melody or rhythm be evil? Me personally, I feel as though uh, it depends on the uh, the intentions, right? But then at the same time, I feel as though that it depends, you know, on the perspective, right? Because some some people might say that, um, let's say like hardcore rock, right? Some people might say that, you know, hardcore rock, you know, might be, you know, like evil music, right? But then at the same time, you know, like another person, you know, who is listening to rock might, might not feel the same way. So I feel as though that like, it depends on like the intentions. And then of course, if you play a beat backwards, I know everybody done it. When you play a beat backwards or like, you know, of course, if you play a song backwards and once when you like get, you know, certain, um, uh, certain <laughs> sayings and everything that, that might sound ominous <laughs> in a sense, you know, so, yeah. so I, I feel as though like it depends on like the person who was, uh, who, who's doing it, like what they stand for and everything, you know, uh, yeah. what do you think? No, I mean, that's, that's, that's deep. I mean, I think that, um, <laughs> yeah, with, I think with everything we do in life, you know, the intention is, is certainly at, at the, at the root of it. Uh, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that your intention is always going to be taken for what it was. It doesn't mean that always your intention, what you put forth is going to reflect your intention, but in terms of the music, um, I think intention is important. I think that music carries power with it. I think that music, just like words uh, and any other utterance, carries power. And so you, you want to keep that in mind. Uh, and your intention is important in terms of what you put out there and why mm -hmm. you put it out there. So yes, I think that's, that's uh, a, a very good point and I think that's important. Um, I know that when we talk about evil music, though, and we talk, let's let's pull it back down into like the church setting. Once again, we're separating the sacred from the secular again. That mm -hmm. there are certain music that hasn't been accepted in the church, or that is struggling to be accepted in the church, because not because of the way, because of the rhythms, because of of the uh, what they are associated with. And so my question was, okay, uh, is, is that valid? In other words, can I take the words out and put other words in and transform that piece from being acceptable to non-acceptable or vice versa? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm gonna just say, let's say that we're doing it uh, with, with honest intentions, with honest intentions because there's all kinds of tricky stuff going on. And so in terms of your intention, that's a whole nother story, but I, and I agree with you with that. But are there, there lyrics and are there melodies and rhythms that should not be played because they're evil? You know, in the history of music, there have been actual notes moving from one note to the other that were forbidden. The Catholic church forbade certain intervals from being played uh, in 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 you know in the uh, you know the early part of, of the development of music, especially when the Catholic Church was running things, there were certain intervals. An interval is the distance from one note to the next. There were certain certain intervals would say you cannot play them because they belong to the devil, and you're not allowed to play them. And somehow that has crept forward into what we do today. And so that whole idea of don't play no Saturday night music in church on Sunday morning is, I think, a remnant of that thing, you know, uh, and, and related the whole idea of, well, I don't want to digress too much, but the idea of, of movement and dance. There was a time in the history of this music when we had something called the ring shout, when you weren't allowed to cross your feet in a particular way in church because it was considered dance, okay? And that was considered evil. So that, that's, that's where I was coming from with that question. Uh, are there just straight up rhythms? De -da, da 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 Is there something about that rhythm that you just can't play because it's evil? 
Or is there a note? Are there, are there notes? Da ba ba do di. But you can't play that in church because it's evil. That's a really good question. Okay. Uh, Bruce and Justice, um, with time constraints that we have. Yes, sir. I'm going to, uh, the next two topics that we have, we'll probably pick them up on the 19th or on Friday. So I want to thank you guys for all the input. It's very, it's been very educational and inspiration to not only me, but I, to, to all of us. So in closing, I just want to take a quote from Wesley Morris, who narrated the 1619 Project podcast, Birth of American Music. And it goes as this. What you're hearing in Black music that's so appealing to so many people of all races across time is possibility and struggle. It is strife. It is humor. It is confidence. And that's ironic because this is the sound of people who for decades and centuries have been denied freedom. And yet when you respond in black music is the ultimate expression of a belief that in that freedom, the belief that the struggle is worth it, that the pain begets joy and that that joy you're experiencing is not only contagious, it is necessary and urgent and irresistible. Black music is American music because as Americans, we say we believe in freedom and that's what we tell the world. And the power of black music is that the ultimate expression of that belief in the American freedom. Mm. So in black music, black people have always had a toy, a story to tell. Please listen to that story because it, it is the story of America. Thank you. Now I would turn it over to Annette Snyder for what's coming up with the In the Loop group. Thanks, Kenny. Um, so first of all, we want to make sure we invite you to come back on Friday, uh, February the 19th. In our usual tradition, we are doing sessions on the 16th and 19th, um, acknowledging the 1619 project. So on Friday, we're going to have an experiential, uh, uh, interactive, musical experience where you have a guided tour of some of these artists. We've heard a lot today, a lot to think about. Um, for all of us. And I think Friday will be a lot of fun. So we can hear some of this and think even further and more deeply. And in case you're not able to come on Friday, we wanna make sure you know a little bit about our upcoming sessions in March, April, and May. In March for Women's History Month, we will be exploring ideas and biases about black women um, to uh, think, consider, um, um, women's history. And in April, we're going to have a session where we have a panel of BIPOC folks. And if you don't know that term, it's a new one for me, actually. It's Black Indigenous People of Color. So we're going to hear about how people who have immigrated to the United States have experienced racism being um, BIPOC in their backgrounds. And then in May, we're going to have a fabulous discussion on liberation theology by our own James Parks. Um, James Parks has been a house moderator and currently works with the General Assembly um, on um, mission and um, loan program. So um, he has a wealth of, of knowledge and um, it'll be a really great discussion in May on liberation theology. So with that, um, I really want to thank our speakers tonight. I, I found this engaging, exciting, interesting, Thank you, Justice, for, for, for <laughs> reaching into my stodgy soul <laughs> and making me think about um, more what's going on today. Um, and Bruce Henderson, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge. Please come back on Friday and listen with us and talk with us about this music. It's really important. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you so much. All right, take care. Take care, Justin.